Hey, I'm Mike Cruz, the founder and CEO of Visible. As you scale your company, having the right guides at your side can make all of the difference. Each episode, we'll talk to fellow founders, investors, and experts. We'll dive into their zone of genius, as well as hear about their past mistakes to give you a better chance of success. This podcast is for founders by founders. This is the Founders Forward. What's up, everyone? Today, I'm joined by Nate Turner. Uh, When I think of experts and what they do, I think Nate is an expert in two things, maybe three, SEO, demand generation, fly fishing. Would you say you're a fly fishing expert, Nate, or just an enthusiast? Yeah, I'd say I'm still I'm still learning on that one. Definitely don't have my ten thousand hours in yet. All right, well, awesome. I uh, have actually known Nate for for a couple of years now. Uh, Nate Turner is the now founder of Ten Speed, which we're going to get into. Uh, but uh, we've actually engaged with Nate in the past, and, and had he's been an, an incredible resource for us to uh, leverage our organic strategy. Uh, Nate started his career in, in as a marketer, spent nine years uh, at Sprout Social, Chicago-based company that more, uh, recently went public, uh, and as mentioned, now is, has uh, become a founder himself. So uh, I'm excited to talk to Nate today about SEO, uh, that journey of being a super early employee at a company and seeing that go public, and then also like the now he's now he's being a founder. So uh, we'll touch on all those. Nate, welcome to the show. Thanks, Mike. I'm really excited to, to be here. Awesome. So I, I guess, you know, maybe just start about wh- where you started, right? Uh, you were at a, a marketing firm, right? Was that kind of just doing website design mm-hmm. and SEO and PPC or, or how, how did you yep. get started in, in the world of marketing? Yeah, I was at the company project managed uh, a website. And at the end, the developer asked me what SEO keywords to add, which I admittedly knew nothing at the time, had to Google what that meant. Um, and just kind of just got hooked on uh, all things SEO and, and started reading and reading. And that was, you know, back in 2008. Yeah, and then leveraged that into a job with an agency doing SEO, PPC, uh, a bunch of web projects. And then from there, joined Sprout Social in 2011. So you joined Sprout Social in 2011. Uh, and that was in Chicago, right? And before that, you were, you were based in St. Louis? Yeah, we yeah we lived in in St. Louis for a few years and moved up to Chicago for uh, for that job as Sprout. Yeah, and how did you get connected with the Sprout team? I I was actually Groupon was was really hot at the time, so I um, I was actually looking at that and and just really just combing through the Lightbank portfolio and a couple other um, Chicago VCs and just all their portfolio companies and. Came, was talking to a couple of different companies actually and, and came across Sprout and they didn't have a job posted, but just loved what they were doing. So I actually just sent an email to the generic email. I think it was grow at Sprout Social or something. Uh, and, and just said, this is who I am. I like what you're building. Uh, this is what I do. I want to do it for you. And you never expect to hear back. And I got an email back from Justin, the CEO, like just a couple hours later, uh, started talking and kind of grew from there and ended up just being good timing. So it was, it was yes. quite uh, serendipitous, really. Yeah. So so the rest is history. I saw on your LinkedIn. So uh, when you started, you were the first marketer mm-hmm. and revenue was around $100,000 at the time and then grew to over $22 million in five years. And just yeah. for some sort of some context for people, because I, th- I think it's interesting, right? Like, Sprout Social is not talked about in like the the tech world of what you read online, uh, but like an incredibly successful company that went public. I think I was just reading ARR at the start of the year was 132 million, and, and it's a publicly traded company now. Uh, mm-hmm. But going back to those like five years, you're the first marketer, uh, and and scaling a product that's relatively low ACV to 22 million dollars. Like, how did you do it? I think that's like the first thing a lot of founders ask. It's like okay, I got some semblance of revenue and product market fit. Uh, I need to grow my SaaS business. Like, how did you go about doing that at, at Sprout? Yeah. Yeah, I would say the, the first, almost the whole first year that I was there, our plans were like 9 and, and $49 a month. And it was a single user platform. So they were already kind of re, rebuilding a lot of the product when I joined, which would ultimately be the foundation for being able to have multi-users, multiple seats, people collaborating in the tool. But really, the first year was like, uh, you know, very low uh, price point and pretty much just focused on SMB. 
And it was all just the the credit card transaction in the app. There was no, at the tail end, we started to have some some folks doing like demos for people, but mm-hmm. um, it really wasn't until a year and a half later that we started adding some inside sales. Uh, they were doing a lot more product demos and starting to add sophistication around um, how we broke up accounts and sizes of accounts. Um, and then also launching that multi-user, which really was a big a big boost um, there because pricing plans went up and also just being able to start charging per user per month and some of the collaboration features really was an accelerant when, as well. When was that roughly, the, the introducing of, of the per user pricing and in collaboration on the, on the tool, do you remember? I, I want to say it was November of 2011. Um, yeah, so a long time ago. That, that yeah. was like, we just uh, spoke with Kyle Poirier from OpenView Ventures last mm-hmm. episode or maybe two ago. We talked about product-led growth and using your product to grow uh, and, and expand. It's like, you guys were like, oh, gee product late growth <laughs> nine years ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it was, like I said, even uh, chatting with Justin before I even came on, he, he was cleared that that was something they were already building. And it just took a while. I mean, they essentially rebuilt, like I said, the whole product. And so it definitely took a while, but so yeah, it was almost like a, a 2.0 type of launch. And so I, I started January, 2011 and by November, I think, I think it was around then that we had launched that. So that was a nice accelerator for sure. But definitely the first year, year and a half was very $9 a month. Most of them were single users to so just a flat $9. So it was much more of a volume play for sure. Where were you finding these customers? I mean, like a lot of companies, we had a big emphasis on paid was a big part of it early on. Um, just because the social space was already fairly established in the sense that we weren't like the first product, but we were probably one of the first that was truly focused on business. So there was decent search volume to tap into on, you know, Google ads and um, some of the other ad platforms at the time. When I joined, we literally just had a homepage. So it was like, you know, had to write feature pages and start to build out the site and and a lot of that stuff. Organic started to pick up from there once we added more site and then the blogging and, and, you know, that happened to grow over time, but certainly paid was a big part for the first, again, kind of 12 to 18 months. Um, is, is where we were getting a lot of it. And then some of it was just a lot of like scrappy stuff, blogger outreach, getting people to write about us, answering questions in Quora, guest blogging, like a lot of things that still work today. Even in the last decade, the the social media landscape has changed. I mean, well, I guess it was invented, uh, but it's really changed. The media companies themselves have changed. And then the tools and companies that you know support or sit on top of those companies like Sprout Social have changed too. I mean, I think there's been... Uh, companies that have come and entered and, and exited this space, but you guys have created yeah. an enduring company. You were there for a long time. What were some of the things that you may, you thought made Sprout Social successful and ultimately taken public? Yeah. Um, so I mean, a couple of things, I think um, the the networks that Sprout has integrated with, Twitter was a big one early on, and, and that's obviously been a network that's sort of prevailed and, and become an important communication factor for companies. And I think the other thing is like the, I would say it was probably a couple years in that Justin and in product leadership really just started to focus a lot on engagement. Um, and, and at that time you had a lot of like point solutions across listening. You had a lot of like social quiz and competition type of, of apps and things like that. But they just had the vision for like engagement as a, the nucleus of all of this. And that's what like all these feed, things feed into engagement. And so I think that focus really started to shift the future roadmap and, and how all the other features were built around that. And so I think that ended up just being a really solid product direction that they took. And then also just over time, it got to that point where you, it's, I think, pretty natural. Like you have all these point solutions and then there becomes consolidation within those. And so... Um, having built a really solid platform um, where people can do publishing and engagement and analytics together opens that up where people were using Sprout with point solutions for listening and things like that. And then also then later uh, in, in the last couple of years, they were able to, to build on stuff like listening and reviews management and stuff that, that really just continue to round out and make it a place that people could uh, do everything they needed to in one place. Yeah. Uh, that's awesome. And 
we'll kind of last sprout question. We'll get into more into SEO sure. and intense speed, but I, I think it's just fascinating. You know, so you started out as the the sole marketer, ended your time there as the VP of demand generation. How did the mix of, of so really you're you're kind of from from start to end, we're in charge of like customer acquisition in, in a way. Yeah. How uh, did the mix and channels evolve over time in terms of acquiring customers? Uh, I think that's like something our audience would love to hear about because I, if you think about what's a problem every single company has, it's I want more customers. So how did, how did that mix change from you, Nate, starting out your career as a sole marketer to mm-hmm. leading a team of 30 people as like the VP of demand gen? Yeah, I mean, certainly, it, like, especially having um, been gone for you know a year and a half or so, it takes a long time really to to decompress from being somewhere like that for so long yeah. and and seeing so much change. Um, and I, I think having had that time, you really do realize that it's there's just so many different phases that you go through and and the the tactics that you're doing and and stuff. So I think, like I said, paid was pretty big early on. And that definitely grew 10, 15 fold um, over that time. But certainly organic became a much bigger portion of that. Um, so, you know, a few years in, you're looking at like pretty sophisticated paid paid channels across a number of Google ads, Facebook, LinkedIn, et cetera. And then the blog uh, was really starting to expand, doing a lot more content. And then we really evolved into like a little bit more like demand gen in the sense of creating guides, ebooks, doing some webinars. Had a lot of success with co-marketing with other marketing like Martech tools, and that there's a never-ending list of them that you can do that. So we worked with a lot that just had good overlap with audience, yeah. like digital marketers, and um, and had a lot of success there. And then just continued to, I would say, we're always testing new channels and tactics, but it, you figure out what works, and you continue scaling it and, and maturing it while you're also starting to get more bandwidth to layer in new things, and it's. Yeah, so you get into paid, SEO, a lot of that stuff. And then the demand gen stuff, PR starts to mature and you do more there. Events became a bigger part later as we went up market a little bit more and had better price points and um, better understanding of sort of our different personas. And then really just continuing to to evolve into um, some of the outbound stuff and layering on enterprise and doing um, some stuff with ABM and and all of that. So certainly inbound and the free trial, uh, the product focused stuff was really you know, always the biggest driver. Um, but yeah. a, a pretty natural evolution, I think, of less dependence on paid. And then as you get more resources and time, you're layering on more tactics and, and more sophistication. Are you allowed to disclose? Is it publicly available? Like how many trials uh, you guys were doing and, and how much you were spending on paid towards the end? Um, I, no, I don't think I could disclose probably paid. Um, and I can't remember honestly on the, the free trials, if that was yeah. like in S1 and, and stuff like that or not. Yeah. Um, so we'll check it should, out. Uh, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I think it's probably in the, in some of the filings, but the, the scale is pretty wild. So, okay. You had this yeah. Kush job, you're at Sprout, it's going public. You got free snacks, a cool office, and then you decide <laughs> to like start your own thing. And I think maybe this week, you publicly announced 10 Speed, uh, which is your new firm uh, that, that you've launched. So I guess, why take the leap from operator to founder? And what's 10 Speed all about? Yeah. Um, so I did have the period between there. So I left Sprout and did consulting um, for about the last year and a half with, with a number of great SaaS companies. And that, that's been a lot of fun. I, you know, I left, I think there were a couple of things like I missed the, like the building and, and scaling up phase. And obviously Sprout has a ton of, of room to keep growing. Um, but what the type of things to do to grow from a hundred million to a billion a year in revenue is just became less, like less interesting to me. It was less passionate. Um, so just recognizing that and not wanting to be staying there just to stay there. And also, uh, just liking uh, having talked to a lot of SaaS founders over the years with uh, just giving advice, networking, all this stuff, like just really enjoyed that aspect. And so find an opportunity to have more flexibility, spend more time with family and still get to work with a lot of great companies and be a little bit more in a building phase. 
Um, so did that for the last year and a half. And then in that time, just really realized that um, as I was doing this like fractional growth marketing, fractional head of marketing type of consulting, like I just found myself most passionate about the like content and SEO, seeing the most opportunity there, uh, wanting to help companies there. And that's what sort of led to 10 speed, which is a content optimization service. And so we are working directly with companies that are already creating content um, for their blog and, and their website. And we essentially just layer on a deep SEO expertise. Um, so people don't have to hire it in house or you don't have to hire a, a full service agency. They really can just layer on what we're, we're doing. So we do a lot of the research and planning and, and then deliver those insights for the teams to write themselves. So that's really what kind of led to it was just the, the passion for that. And my co-founder, Kevin, has also been in SEO and in content for a long time. It's something that we wanted to do and just build it uh, and have the opportunity to actually build and, and scale something beyond like solo consulting where I was pretty, pretty quickly reached a cap. Yeah. What? So do I need to know anything about SEO to engage with the guys? Or, hey, I'm super passionate about, uh, I don't know, healthcare information systems. And I'm, my product solving that and I'm writing on a blog about it. Are you just taking what I've done and repurposing that? So it's friendly for Google and organic search. Um, yes. So there's sort of two mechanisms. One is if you have content that's declined in performance or is, is just not quite performing as well as it could be that we guide how to optimize that and, and help it perform better. And then we also guide the creation of new content. And so it's for some, it's it's only new if you're earlier, like an earlier stage company. But uh, for most, it's it's a mix of that optimizing what's already there and also guiding the creation of new. And the the optimization is really like an ongoing process. It depends from almost from topic to topic uh, how competitive it is. Some things really need to be optimized every couple months just to stay competitive and keep generating traffic. Others or maybe once a year. So it's definitely an ongoing process, but it helps. Um, avoid some of that decline and, and really give a lot more compounding growth to you know, organic. Yeah, awesome. Where does the name Ten Speed come from? Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, I think it was uh, a lot of. I think we went through a pretty legit branding exercise, and one of the things was just really talking about how exciting it is when you experience like optimizing content for the first time, and it's just you get so pumped up when you see the performance jump up from that and it's exciting and liberating. You just want to expand and go. And so just something that we, we correlated to that feeling when you're, when you're a kid and you like get your first 10 speed bike and it's sort of like this rite of passage. And it's like this thing that like, you're like, Oh man, like I can you know, ride around the neighborhood or whatever it might be. It's just like, it's exciting and liberating. And it's just something that we drew a parallel to that. So that's mostly where it came from. I love it. That's really cool. I didn't yeah. know that was a name. I'm glad I asked. Training wheels are off. 10 speed spot. Yeah. Getting exactly. around town for free. So <laughs> I love it. I think a lot of people take a look at, at Visible and some of the work we've done with SEO. And we get this question a lot. And and we don't have a great answer. This is why I'm going to ask you this question. You're, you know, I'm an early stage founder. And I'm like, oh, man, I would love to have organic leads coming my way, right? Like, uh -huh. that's all, that sounds awesome. Uh, and I have some slice of marketing budget. How should I think about, like, SEO if I'm just getting started? Like, what should I do? Like, what are best practices for me to, to start thinking about how to leverage uh, those compounding benefits you mentioned? Like, how do I get to that 10-speed type feeling? Yeah, I would say there's a couple things. One is there's always always a need to really think as SEO is just a holistic component of everything you're doing. It's not it's not just the blog content or just some keywords. It's really what platform you're on, how fast is your site, all of these you know sort of technical factors. So I think there's there's an opportunity to be intentional about how you're building everything from the ground up from SEO, which really doesn't cost you that much. Like as long as you're just doing a little research and planning ahead. And then on the content side, I would say, I think it's definitely like when you really have a, a, a finite budget, it's hard. And I think it's something that it inevitably just becomes this thing that, you know, like it, either we're going to go hard and like really invest in this and put a lot of resources into writing, scaling it up quickly so we could see results sooner. 
or it's something like we're going to start building out content, creating content, but we just know that one or two posts a month is not going to build a, a very substantial library over time. And so it's going to, it's going to take a little while to really get enough there that we're seeing some traction starting to get leads, but we know we need to start it sooner than later. I would say that's the big thing. And then the the third piece is there is always the, the additional benefits of content, which is your site is just a little more well-rounded. There's people that can educate themselves on, on some different topics before they engage with you. There's just more posts that you can have for sharing content on social or for sales reps to send as a follow-on. There's all kinds of additional things that come out of that. So if you can kind of also allow yourself to think about all the benefits that are coming from, from creating uh, content, then I think that helps as well because it's, it's can be feeding a lot of, of the marketing you're doing. But yeah, it's hard to like really make it a dependent channel without making it a, a big focus early on. So it's just building towards the future on so what's like the, on the flip of that, what's like the biggest mistake you see companies early on make with their SEO strategy? Is it not investing enough? Is it just killing it off too early because results take a long time to come to fruition? What are some things you think that are are common that you see that are just mistakes that maybe companies could avoid? Yeah, I think definitely like um, trying to look at it from like pure ROI right from the beginning, like we paid a writer $200 for this post and it didn't generate more than $200. That's a very direct expectation of like dollar in dollar out. And so it's, there's certainly a little bit of that like long tail aspect. And like I, I just said, like feeding other marketing um, activities that there are benefits that come from that as well. I think another issue is like I mentioned before, like not thinking about it in a, in a holistic way. It's like when you let SEO be an afterthought, we, hey, we redesigned all this and we're going to replatform and redesign all stuff. And then, oh, let's figure out SEO. And you kind of like can run into some headaches. Um, and I think as companies get bigger, there also could be, you're not really drilling down into kind of how and where. Then I think sometimes you can have a feeling that your organic is, is really strong for some reasons, but it might just be like a lot of brand. Like you're putting a ton of money into your blog and like organic is growing, but actually like a lot of that is branded queries and you're not really making sure that you're looking at blog performance and then also kind of the opposite as well. And you're not understanding some of the other parts of your site that are or activities you're doing that are really feeding um, some of the organic volume that you're getting as well. So um, I would say that's, that's probably some of the bigger ones. Yeah. And if I'm a new startup and I... Um, maybe I'm in a brand new category, something doing some c- completely new, right? Uh, where there might not be much keyword demand gen or uh, I mean, shit, I might even pivot in the next nine months because uh, we couldn't find a way to make our, our current thing work. You know, what is your what is your thought there in terms of should I invest in SEO before I'm ready, like in, in fine product market fit? And what if there's not a lot of of demand for uh, at least maybe organic as a uh, organic search as a channel. How should I think about that as, as it fits into my holistic approach for, for demand gen? Yeah, I would say um, I'll answer those kind of two separately. If, yeah. if you don't have product market fit, um, I, I think it's, if you're going to like do a hard pivot into just something totally different, then that's like probably don't want to be doing it quite yet. If it's, more of a pivot of like, well, we were going to go freemium. Now we're going to go more like ABM up enterprise mm-hmm. level or something. Then it's probably okay. And then even, and then also like if it's new market, not really search volume, because those two factors, if you're not really pivoting away from the audience and the buyer and, and, or, and, or it's a new space. Um, I think it's, it's so much more about like getting away from, the keywords or the topics and like really just understanding who your audience is um, and what they care about, what their pain points are. And you're figuring out like, what are a lot more of the like informational. Cause like when people think about, Oh, there's no search volume in my, in my space. Like those are very like transactional intent based keywords. Like I'm going to, I need social media software like that. Clearly you're going to type social media software and you're like, you're intending to, to buy research and buy, but like 
like when you think about the fact that you're always selling to people in whatever you're doing and those people have problems and they have interests and need information, then like you can always find informational queries and content to write about to educate your audience, uh, whether or not your, your, you know, market has, is still nascent or whatever. I think that that's all still very relevant and helpful. Yeah. I think even when I was just searching around uh, before we chatted about Sprout Social, I, uh, one of the things that I think is like the top ranking post, even when I Googled Sprout Social was uh, the always updated guide to like image sizes and best practices for like my social media images, right? That's like, you guys aren't creating those images for people, but that's like something clearly your audience would would care about. Absolutely. Yep. What about highly competitive SEO? I'm a CRM and right, I'm going against Salesforce and HubSpot and Pipedrive and all these other CRMs, Intercom. Should I try to rank for those were SEO or should I try to enter a highly competitive space and, and go for it with, with that? Or how do you think about a highly competitive space? I'm sure social media is highly competitive as well, right? Yeah. I'm, yeah, definitely. I, I think um, two, two parts to that one is of course, those like really core transactional head terms are always going to be extremely competitive, but there's, to say, it'll just stick with the, the example of, of CRM. You know, if we were to drop Salesforce and a couple others into some tools and look at all the content they have and all of the keywords they rank for, it's going to be hundreds of thousands of keywords, if not in the millions. And that just means that there's a, a very wide, wide opportunity there for a lot of different content topics. So I think there's different schools of thought of like how you approach it. Do you go only start at long tail? You invest in, they call like barbell or whatever, like you're investing in a couple big pieces, but also balancing that with a lot of other stuff. Uh, it's more long tail, but it's, it's, there's always opportunity. And that's, I think part of what makes SEO so much fun and so interesting is that things are always evolving. Competitors are slacking on keeping their site up to date and it opens up opportunities for new people to come in and all kinds of, of things that it just, it's probably in most cases going to like the reality that like you're going to, it'll be like a bigger investment to, to mm-hmm. do well and compete. But typically competitive spaces also have pretty wide, you know, like wide range of keywords too. And so there's just a lot of things that you can start to build up traffic, build up links, and then reach a point where you're really able to compete in some of that more highly competitive stuff. You mentioned tools in there. Are there like tools you you think all or any company should be thinking about? Like I'm just getting started. I'm handling demand gen. I'm the founder of my company. What kind of tools should I think about? Just like that I just adopt quickly and just get me into like SEO 101. Yeah. I would say like, Google Search Console is amazing and it's free. So you get a ton of insights from there. And that's um, something that that you know, SEOs are using all the time. Um, I would say like Screaming Frog or some sort of site crawler that's crawling through and, and identifying a lot of the technical issues or opportunities. And then I would say Ahrefs, SEMrush, Moz, one of those SEO tools that I think gives you a lot of that keyword research, site performance, on-page opportunities, all that stuff are, are three sort of three types of tools that would be a really good place to start. Okay, that's helpful. And what about mobile? What should I care about mobile and my mobile site performance? And that just kind of came to mind. But as these tools have emerged and, and there's billions of mobile devices, how should I think about mobile for my, my company? Yes. So obviously like page speed, overall is is a very important factor and just creating a good experience there's been certainly it's an ongoing thing not like all at once but a big shift that most or a lot of companies i should say not not necessarily most but a lot of companies are now google considers mobile first indexing so there's actually a a priority um to the mobile side versus desktop um and so there's certainly you could look at do page speed grading tools for websites and they can have a really great sort of desktop speed and a terrible mobile speed. So there's definitely attention there from that standpoint and also just mobile, like the way it looks like the, the, the UX and, and the design and everything. So all that's certainly important and does 
play a pretty big factor in, in how you're doing that. And then beyond that, I would say each company within search console analytics, just be studying like how much is coming from mobile, what stuff are people looking at? You're probably going to be a lot more like research focused stuff, like blog posts or things you send out in newsletters or feature pages, things that they're like researching and consuming that way. But uh, yeah, certainly always look that way. But if you're completely ignoring it, it definitely could be uh, an opportunity to have some good improvements and some quick wins. What about what I actually use to put my site on? Like WordPress was a standard, I think, for the longest time. I think you're seeing a lot of people talk about headless CMSs now. There's like excitement around what you could do with Webflow. Is there, can I pick the wrong way to, to think about like what I should build my site on? Uh, and, and how does that affect me later on? Um, yeah, so I, I would say there are certain technologies, pretty much anything you're planning on using. If you just Google, you know, Webflow SEO, Squarespace SEO, React SEO, there's tons of information for any of them. And so I think that's typically first, especially if you're really trying to use like cutting edge, this is the latest and greatest. It just came out. Like there's inevitably going to be less information on those, but like you should be able to get some sense of how it's like crawled, perceived, Mm -hmm. how some of the customization you have in terms of site structure and how, how like being able to control how search engines crawl your site, I think is, is typically important. But beyond that, like, I think a lot of, a lot of sites you typically can be, um, Oh, sorry. And I'll also just say like, there's um, variation in how much you can control to optimize the speed of your site, mm-hmm. which again is, is important. So I think um, some of those levers, like you want to make sure you're going to be able to control all the things you need to there. But I would say outside of that, you're typically you know able to control your site map and your robots.txt and set up 301 redirects and whatever you need to do to shape and mold your site to to run quickly and uh, and perform, I think you can do that. So certainly are platforms that could be bad. Obviously, we all know now that like you shouldn't build websites in Flash, but there's still some things that I think look a little bit more shiny package, new technology, but could also have some of those issues and how the data is rendered and how it's crawled, stuff like that. That's something we've been thinking about is just, do we want to try to, just seems like a huge project to try to use something more modern it's just it's like switching off a of salesforce it's i'm locked in now can't i can't change so yeah, and, we'll see what happens moving, yeah moving is also i mean like so starting if you start out on webflow like you may have a few things here and there but like you're probably going to be um fine you know but like mm-hmm. if you want to move from whatever you're on to webflow there's just all these little things you might come across with um how some of it's handled with uh, like DNS and how like if it forces a trailing slash and therefore literally every URL has to be redirected or different things like that, that can be a challenge when you're actually migrating. It's always, you can always do it. You can always change and do the right things and recover from any dip in performance, but yeah, just things to watch out for. Yeah. We did a, I did a live case study last episode. So I'm going to put you on the spot for one here. Okay. Uh, okay. So visible, right? We've scaled trials almost 140% year over year. So now we have a, a, actually a good amount of trials coming in. And a lot of our call to actions on our content, our blog and things we build on the demand gen side are to start a trial. Because uh, we have like a super frictionless trial experience. So you can just drop in your email, magic link type sign up, and you can confirm your account and password later. Should... So what are some of the things we're thinking about, though, are should we actually maybe not push everyone to start a trial because maybe it's not the right time? And should we try to nurture someone uh, maybe as, quote, unquote, marketing qualified, day, like someone that maybe downloads a piece of content, is reading our blog, subscribes to our newsletter? Uh, like, it, should we think about maybe not funneling everyone to start a trial? Either way, we grab their email, right? So for us, we get their email, we can market to them how we need to, but from a I guess a marketing psychology standpoint, uh, is it like once I start a trial, it's like I'm deciding to buy or not? Yeah, I think, um, so we did did a ton of this at Sprout in the the later years when we just had a lot more traffic and could do uh, more 
data analysis and and A-B testing at a post, a blog post level. And really it was like, look at the data, understand how it's converting. And then just in in most cases, it was like a post by post basis doing ABC or ABCD test of like free trial or a demo request or a guide download or something else and understand like what is actually, and in, and ultimately always trying to track through to revenue. Uh, Cause if you just put a newsletter sign up, it's probably always going to be higher, really understanding page by page basis, like what's actually aligning there. And there's certain things you could probably look at and bucket. Like this is a very high level topic. This is very introductory. Like this is probably bringing people in, but they're always away in the buying process from, mm-hmm. from being ready. You could make some assumptions and, and bucket certain types and, and do CTAs. But I do think that's, it's very important. It's just contextualizing what, understanding what's the, the search intent, what were people, what are, what's going on with them right now to why they're reading this content. It does going into a trial right now make sense. Like I said, use some common sense, but when you have enough traffic that you could actually do some of that testing too, that that's really, could be huge for just really resonating getting them in the right thing. And then if it is higher higher up and you nurture them, then you're just priming to be in a better place and be um, further along in that buying process when they do try it, that it's going to resonate better. It'd probably be a little more of a sticky trial uh, experience and then hopefully a higher conversion to paid. So two questions for me. Uh, talk about measurement. Like, is there... What are kind of best practices for measurement to make sure that I'm tracking things properly, you know, uh, across my site? And then if I'm a SaaS company, my app, uh, and then what is enough traffic? You mentioned like, Hey, we got a lot of traffic. Is it like, I, I, is there like an absolute number? Is it like, I need 10,000 people reading this blog post? Is it a hundred people? Uh, so like, yeah, what, what type of tracking tools and what is like enough traffic? Um, yeah, so I would say at the very least, like you're tracking what those sort of lead uh, conversions are in like analytics platform, it's Google Analytics or whatever. Um, and that's sort of the the base level. So you can kind of know trial conversions, demo, whatever it might be. Um, if you're using HubSpot, I think they do this pretty well, like pull it all through or segment and some other tools, I think can connect the DOS with anonymous IDs or building it custom, but like really being able to connect through by channel and and conversion and kind of understand what's leading to revenue the best. So from that page, which conversion type then led to the most revenue. So I think those are, you know, a couple examples of how to pull it through Mm -hmm. and see all the way through to revenue. And then in terms of the volume, I would say, There's, by the time we were doing a lot of that, we were like doing true like statistical significance and, you know, power and like true like stats and proper conversion optimization. But obviously when we started conversion, like testing, A-B testing in 2011 and, and a lot of times it was like, obviously in those cases, you're not really like tracking through to revenue, but it was at least setting a a bar that's like, both, both experiences have to get 50 conversions or something. So what is that limit? And then once they both have at least 50, then you're looking at performance again. So I think it's definitely, there's things you can do to be less scientific early on when you have less traffic, but you're at least getting some good directional uh, insights. And then as you get more like true statistical significance. Awesome. Well, thanks for that. Uh, Anything else before we wrap? Anything else you want to share or impart wisdom with, with the visible community? I've enjoyed this. Hopefully some of my answers weren't too wishy-washy. It's a lot of case-by-case basis on content and SEO and even some of the growth stuff. But, but I I think there's, uh, there's always opportunities. One thing I would say is when I I think we kind of alluded to this earlier, but like when you're, you want to do SEO and like you want to do content and you want to, that to be a meaningful channel, then I think it typically just needs to be just a top down and bottom up commitment Mm -hmm. that like, this is something we want to be a long-term performer for us. And, and we're not going to you know, measure performance right away. And we're, and we're going to keep investing and building towards the, that opportunity. It's not a, it's not a set it and, and forget it type thing. Yeah. Or, you know, let's test a hundred dollars and see if this works. Like, like you can with a lot of other channels. That's great. But I think typically you got to have that alignment. And you know, I had yeah. that alignment with Justin and Sprout and, and we have that with a lot of our, 
uh, customers with 10 speed is, as we know, that's just a, it's not a quick test. It's, it's a long-term commitment. And I think that's important. All right. Last question. Uh, what's been the most shocking thing or, or uh, just like you're a founder now, right? So you've been, you know, you started your own business. Uh, what, what's like been the one thing that's caught you by surprise or, or that you're just like, Oh man, this is, this is hard. Yeah, it's definitely like early in this, like in the trenches. And I would say we just tried to put together some rough planning for 2021, uh, which hopefully we don't have another big curveball thrown our yeah. way like, like this yeah, year. But, <laughs> uh, it just like when you really start breaking it down and, and realizing like, oh, there's like sort of this finance and these operations and this is what we need to do to build out payroll and benefits and all kinds of different things that it, it's, it's far outside of just growth and, and marketing realm and, and all, yeah, it, not, it is all aspects of, of yeah. the company. I think uh, it's definitely been uh, a reality check uh, so far, yeah. but, but it's also exciting. A lot, of, a lot of things to learn and to build too. Yeah, awesome. I love it. Well, they, I can't thank you enough for your time. Thanks so much for, for jumping on and, and helping us think through uh, organic search and, and SEO and demand gen. And uh, we'll, we'll talk to you soon. Yeah. Thanks for having me. All right. See you.